in with a stencil to do some beautiful um, removing marks on the wings, such an interesting way and soft and beautiful way to create some um, patterns on the butterfly's wings. And then if you're so inclined, we'll finish off with a black marker. And on this one, I've um, just gone around and outlined the wings. I'll just pull that down a little bit. Um, Having said that, on this one, I'm because I'm doing it again, I'm trying to make a few things a little bit different. So I might avoid just the um, automatic outline. I think because of the way that we do lots of colouring in as children, my I have this automatic um, obsession isn't the quote, this is a little bit strong, but an automatic desire to just outline everything. So I thought on this one, I would try and avoid my desire to just outline in a continuous line and maybe try a broken line, maybe, I don't know. Uh, we'll see how we come, um, see what it's like at the moment that we come to the outlining part. So um, the removing of the marks on the butterfly's wings is an opportunity for you to do yours a little differently to mine. Um, and uh, hi, hi, Fan, and hi, Natasha. And um, yeah, so when we come to the removal part, we're going to be making our own stencil. So it's an opportunity to make your butterfly different to everyone else's. Having said that, as always, if you want to do yours exactly like mine, then do that too. I never mind uh, what you do. In fact, it's kind of weird to say that because I can't actually see what you're doing. I'm so used to um, talking to a classroom of people, which normally I'm, I can see exactly what they're doing. But of course, um, we're doing YouTube Live, completely different. You get to um, do yours at home. And then if there's anything in the live stream that you enjoyed, you get to rewatch it and you can fast forward um, to bits that you found particularly useful. So I'm going to go through my pile of stuff here of stuff to remind you of what I've got ready to go. So I'm going to get rid of that painting and just put the this one aside. Get rid of the mouse. Okay, firstly, here's our plan. We're going to be, it's a swallowtail butterfly that we're working on. We're going to glaze the butterfly. So put another layer of blue. I'm choosing blue. You can choose any color. Always go with a color palette that you think would look beautiful. But I'm doing blue on blue today. Then we're going to glaze the background as well and um, make some of these flowers pop out a little bit by darkening the outside. So I'm negatively painting and glazing at the same time when I paint around these flowers. Uh, going back to my list here, then we'll make a stencil. And um, I've got a tip because the butterfly is a symmetrical object or a symmetrical shape. I've got a tip for you for the stencil making to cut your time in half. And um, the other thing I wanted to say about stencils is um, I was thinking about people who are part-time watercolorists. I know lots of you are completely into watercolor, but I also know lots of you are totally into other media as well. And the stencil is something that works in multiple um, medias. Media. Don't you love that? Is it mediums or media? Those uh, plurals exist at the same time at the moment. Uh, and then the final thing we'll do is a black marker. So that's my plan. Get rid of that one. As always, the resources you can find, uh, like the butterfly picture we're working from, on my Facebook page, Marion Chapman Artist Sydney. And I did keep, I think I mentioned last week that you could hang on to the stencil, not the stencil, not hang on to the um, design that you did on your uh, spare paper. This was bank paper. But it occurred to me that the background of where I've covered it with a bit of pastel is going to make it a little messy to use. So I'm actually going to ditch that one. So I'm going to chuck that in my bin and make a new one. It'll actually just be really fast. So I wanted to show you a couple of instances, no, an instance where I've used um, a stencil to remove the detail in the butterfly wings. So if you have lots of paint down or multiple layers of paint down, when you do your remove, it's much easier. 
So that's my first tip for your butterfly today. When you glaze another layer on top, if it's not quite dark enough, glaze another layer. I'm hoping that today I'll only need one layer of glazing down so that, um, hi, Philip, so that when I remove my details on the butterfly wings, it's sufficiently interesting. Having said that, you could redo that uh, stage if you wanted to. So that's just an example of a butterfly painting that I experimented with. And because uh, the stencil, because uh, in this painting, I mean, I had a reflection going, I all I did to add a little bit of extra detail was stencil the um, what was supposed to be like a little bit of a shadow. I've got a spare butterfly painting. I'll just turn this one round. And I, <laughs> this is totally the tip of the iceberg. Last week I showed you some uh, photos of paintings that I've done because some of them are sold. A lot of them I chop up and do other things with. Um, and some of them are framed and I can't show you on YouTube. Um, but I did find these couple, seriously, I must have painted the butterfly 150 times. I thought I might just experiment with the stencil making and show you the method uh, on this one because it's one of those many paintings that I'm like, oh, is it any good? Hey, Liz, how are you? All right, continuing through my pile here. That's the resource that I mentioned is on my Facebook page, a link to it, and Media Storehouse is where I found the actual image. This is what we did last week. So I thought I'd very briefly run through uh, that you needed stuff that you needed. We won't need a spray bottle today. I am, well, who knows? The image, black pen, uh, the marker. So we used the black pen last week. This will we'll use the marker, acetate. Uh, you could use an x-ray and I, we talked about some other things that you could do. And this week I received a, well, actually I didn't receive, we got to go on picnics. I'm just trying to dig this out from the bottom. We got to go on picnics and my mother-in-law brought along a box of a gift that she'd received. And the box, I'm just going to turn it so it flickers at you. The top of the um, box came with a piece of acetate and I thought that's another place that you can find acetate uh, you don't have to buy it just be inventive and as creative so that's one of the things we do all the time right and chuck that in uh, a blade so that we can cut the acetate and a hairdryer that may be necessary today as well hi Amanda did I say that already <laughs> I just looked up and saw your name and I can't remember if I said it um we don't need this book anymore because we've drawn the butterfly, but I just, that's um, a, the book where I got the How to Draw a Butterfly. Awesome resource. Uh, right, so I've gone through that list. I can chuck that now. Oh, I also have this beauty that I found on, where did I find it? Royalty Free. And I chatted briefly about royalty free images versus ones that are copyrighted. Uh, get rid of that one. That's where we got up to last week. We painted a background and we splattered and sprayed. Uh, then we chose our colours, painted the background. The colours will be exactly the same. I've basically got the three primaries, a yellow, a red and a blue, lemon yellow, quinacridone magenta and phthalo blue. Um, I've listed those in the top of the chat in case you're wondering specifically. Painted the background, we drew the butterfly, we transferred the butterfly, we glazed the butterfly. So we got halfway through the glazing and um, today we're going to do more glazing and then we're going to finish the background, um, maybe at a marker. We got the pen done. We did a continuous line drawing with the um, flowers, um, which reminds me that on Facebook, uh, Karen posted an extraordinary uh, continuous line painting and a little <laughs> joke about how long that might have taken. Um, very funny. Here is the other things I've got ready is a piece of acetate. That's the piece that I've already used. And I have a cutting board. I have a, but any, you know, piece of cardboard we just fine. Uh, this is a Stanley knife. Any sort of blade will do the job. I've also, oh, I'll go keep going through my pile. 
got a piece of bank, another piece of bank paper because I'm going to reuse this when it comes time for remake for making the stencil. I'm going to use another piece of this bank paper, which is just a translucent paper. It's not transparent. It's translucent. Forgive me if I mix up those two words. Um, it's really easy to mix up your words when you're creating and painting and then you're talking and, and attempting to share everything at the same time. So I regularly make uh, mix up my words. Um, here is Karen says, I buy binding clear covers, A4 from Officeworks 25. They work so well. And from, oh, there you go, even cheaper. Yeah, and that's probably what the, that I'm using is a clear cover. I have a sponge and a towel just so that I can wipe my hands because I'm about to, I will stip it into the uh, water. But any sponge will do the job. This is a super cheap um, kitchen sponge. Um, very, very uh, cheap and very clean. I wouldn't use one that you've actually used in the kitchen because um, of oils and you don't want to introduce oils, any anything foreign into your painting uh yeah so this will work brilliantly and you could tear a bit off you could cut a bit off these are the little kitchen cleaning sponges these work brilliantly but again you might actually have one of these beautiful ones a student gave me that lovely christine and it's a real sponge and she got it overseas remember overseas holidays remember when we used to go <laughs> you know if you were lucky enough you planned one of those wonderful uh, holidays where you left Australia. Uh, so um, that time might be coming again. This is a natural sponge and it's very um, beautiful to feel. And I thought since she gave it to me, I really should uh, use it. So I've got a, some clean water for the sponge towel because I know that I'll need it to wipe my hands, get rid of that. Oh, and I left this here as a little reminder to talk briefly about, there's the colours that we use, the yellow, blue, and it's magenta, but I use it as a red. One of the things you can always think about um, in the planning of your work is the warm versus cold um, ratio. Uh, Stephen Quiller, that amazing water um, artist, not just watercolour, amazing colour theorist, says let one win. He's into let a colour win and he's also into let either the warm or the cool win. It's one of the things that is marvellous at the end of the painting when you come to that stage and you're thinking what's wrong? The warm versus cold ratio can be a marvellous way to decide how to improve your painting. So I wanted to mention that at the beginning because hopefully I'll think of that at the end because it's so easy to adjust the warm versus cold ratio at the end. Um, make it a little colder with a little more phthalo. Make it a little warmer with a little more orange. I mixed quinacridone and yellow lemon together and made an orange so here's that painting again, just going back to the one we're working on. Um, <laughs> one second. My husband's just come in and given me a little post-it note and I just totally lost my track of um, what I was up to. You can see why I keep lists. It really helps me focus in on, oh, where was I going with all that? Oh, totally lost my um, train of thought. I was going to tell you something about the painting. Oh, no, it's gone. I'm just going to have to move forward. <laughs> Warm, cool, balance. Okay, I remembered. Ah! <laughs> uh, this one has a dominant cool subject matter and a really warm um, background. If there's a disconnect, you could add a little bit of cool to the background or you could add a little bit of warmth to your foreground main subject matter. It could be sometimes that you feel like it's not quite working because one is not quite winning. Ooh, what's winning at the moment? Is it the cool or the warm? Mm. 
that's a discussion for um, when we get to the end. That's how I lost my track because I lost my little bit of paper. Warm, cold, balance. It's a fascinating, interesting area of how you're going in um, your painting and a way of helping you resolve it at the end. We are going to start by glazing. Get rid of that one. Let's glaze. I'm going to move out the camera out a little bit so you can see my palette a little more. How's that? Not too bad. I'll put in a little bit more of oh, my brushes. Now, this last week I think I used this big mop brush in the background. I'm not actually positive. Today we're glazing small areas and I'm going to put a layer of water down and then add the colour to it. I'm going to put this brush way away from my painting so I don't even try and pick it up because it's so super absorbent and so capable of holding so much water that if I put a layer of water on my butterfly using this enormous mop brush, I will have too much water and then I'll just be dealing with backgrounds. Instead, dumping that brush, I'm going to be putting a layer down of water with this size 2 um quill which has a very controlled amount of water and probably I'll do it in a sector and a sector and um, a layer of water and then a layer of blue. Right. I'm going to move some of those things a little bit out of the way. We're going to glaze the butterfly. Okay. Um... Flat brush for at the end, I often do a little lifting. We're going to be lifting with a stencil, but I often use a flat brush just to lift. And I've got a small, uh, a, a range of brushes here. This is a size two, this is a size zero, this is a size triple zero, and then I've got my little tiny uh, liner brush as well. So I've, I've placed them large to small. Um, not that they'll stay there, sometimes I play and um, move them about a little bit. Now, I'm going to wet this big brush and that's gonna be for my water. Then I'm gonna wet my next brush so that I can activate this blue. So the first thing I did when I took off the cover to my palette was spray it. I just get my spray bottle and it just begins to activate the paints that's there. If I'm painting large sections like we were last week, I squeezed out all fresh colour. It makes me a little faster. I'm just going to move that up a little bit. Okay. I'm going to get a practice piece of paper. Just uh, This is a quick old painting that didn't quite work. Use the back. And I want to look at how the tone is of my blue. Will that be too dark? Now, it won't be that dark. We're putting a layer of water down that will lighten it up. So that means it might be a lovely version, but there's not enough. I need to have enough blue mixed up so that I don't stop in the process. Dump that. I want to paint that, keep going, paint that. Keep, I want to go, 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 go. So I don't want to be stopping in the middle of it. I'm just searching for my pipette, which I usually have sitting close by. I literally have about 100 of them. <laughs> and not one next to me. I'm going to just spray it with a spray bottle. I want a lot of blue. Move that so I can't accidentally. Right, which means, of course, I've now lightened that. I just splattered blue everywhere. Ugh. Okay, now how's it? Much lighter. And sometimes you do need to do a big swatch in order to really see the intensity of the colour. So I'm just going to take a second and encourage some of that thalo blue to mix into the water. I want a big batch. Can't 
have too much slightly darker I'm just going to go another second and this is the point at which it would have been faster had I squeezed some phthalo out but doesn't matter I've started on the journey oh this is a little bit like um painting with those blocks of ink that the Japanese do and the first part of their process is to start to make the ink they activate the ink uh, so maybe I should just be getting meditative and going, oh, this is lovely as I stir and massage the paint. Or you might just think that's so uh, scary. <laughs> Natasha says, so scary, I'd be worried to make a big swatch. Indeed. Go for it, Natasha. Don't hold back. Okay, here's my water brush. I'm going to do this sector that sector, that sector, here's my brush that is full of water and I'm going to commit gliding, gliding like a butterfly, gliding, gliding. Don't be careful, it's just the water part. Now be careful with the actual brush. I'm using the tip to go to the edge, the body to paint quickly and bring it down bring it down don't take too much time don't go over stuff oh lots of don'ts there hey eh? we're glazing so you want the paint to go down with as few strokes as possible for all you golfers you'll be understanding that comparison as few strokes as possible straight into the next one water we're gliding over we're not agitating the layer beneath we're attempting to do quite the opposite we're gliding and trying not to disturb the layer underneath you want to be like the duck that glaze that glides atop, across the top of the water and try not to go back over the sectors that you've already glazed because you want it to remain as a permanent layer beneath this layer. We're adding a layer. We are not trying to mix it. We're trying to glaze on top, like adding a layer of glass. This is the beauty of this brush is that I'm able to paint wide sections and use the tip to create some small sections. I'm going to just tip it for a second in case I've got any pools of paint which will cause a back run. Nope, all good. Keep going. Water. Gentle, gentle glaze of water over the butterfly and straight into the blue. I'm going to zoom in on this one so that you can see that a little bit better. Oops, I went outside the line. I don't want to take them. <laughs> I need to turn it around. That would have helped. Reload. I don't want to take too long by, and wait to correct things because I want a beautiful, even glaze. Totally going against what I just said there, aren't I? Anyway, everything's just an idea and you might have a better way of doing it or you might be doing it exactly as I'm doing it. We're putting a quick layer of water on top and it's a thin layer so that we are in control with the amount of water and then coming in with that brush that has a fine tip and the tip allows you to 
go to the edges. Don't take too long on the edges, particularly if you're going to use a black marker. You can be thinking, I can resolve any problems on the edge of the butterfly with a black marker. So that's another reason not to overdo it. There's a little bit of blue crap. Just quickly removing that so that I can keep going down to the bottom. Down to the tail, in fact. It's not really a tail. All right, and then again, I'm going to look at it on the side because on the side I can see any glazing, any excessive amount of water, and I can try and prevent any backruns. So I took too long up here. There's a backrun forming already. So um, it's in that semi-dry state. There is nothing I can do. I could... It's so tempting to just repaint that wing, but that wing is attached to this wing and I will just get into a world of trouble. I'm going to add some lovely depth to the body with that same blue and I'm going to dip into the base. I'll just zoom out a little so you can see me dipping into the blue. If I move that there. Move that and that. Right, so this here's my lump of blue. It's a hardened lump. And at the base of that lump is some luscious, wet, dark blue. And this paint I'm about to apply is darker, is darker and thicker than the um, paint that is already on there. And if I'm lucky, I'm just going to reapply, wipe off the excess. If I'm lucky, I won't cause a back run. If you were to apply a lighter wash, it would it would therefore be a mix of paint that has a higher water ratio and you would force back runs. In fact, that, that's how you force back runs is add a mix that is wetter. Hopefully this is more viscous. I'm going to paint the body. Maybe I'll leave out some eyes, maybe leave out the nose. Very easy to cover up later on if I don't like that look. Last week we did some little highlights. I'm going to attempt to negatively paint those highlights again. Go around. Negatively paint just means go around or skip. And I'm just completing the body. And if I want it black when it comes time and I'm using that black marker, I could make it black then. Okay, now I'm going to touch these sides and oops, just changed the shape accidentally of the head. So I <laughs> just compensated. <laughs> by making it symmetrical. I think you get away with it. As long as it's symmetrical, you'll get away with it. Oops, I've made the body a bit wonky too. Okay, I'm going to stop because I'm not improving it. Okay, I do have a back run going on up there. I'll just show you that. So that means that maybe that sector needs to be re- um, painted or I'll very likely work out a way later on to, um, you know, maybe I'll put a stencil out a little bit there. Maybe I'll paint more, uh, glaze on a bit on that wing later on. Maybe it'll look all right. Maybe it'll look like a texture. Maybe I'll add black. I will work out how to problem solve that area uh, towards the end of the painting. I'm not going to focus on it now. Not at all. I'm going to just zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole painting. Yep, right. And um, uh, we're going to start to think about the glazing of the background. 
Um, we can mix up the colour that we're going to choose to glaze around these flowers. I like the idea of glazing around. I'm just going to show you the painting that I did as my prep painting. I started down here. You can see it's quite different colours um, mix. The colours are, are very similar, but the ratio, this has a lot of yellow and this had a lot of magenta. Um, so uh, a thousand possibilities happen when you mix your own colours. I love that. I'm going to be negatively painting these flowers in the same way that I negatively painted those. It's quite subtle. It's a really pale wash that I've added around those flowers. And that's what I want to do there is add a really pale wash, <laughs> wash around these flowers. Now, this butterfly is wet. If we come up here and touch the edge of this, it might bleed. And if you like that idea, then just start now and or you could start up here if you wanted to. But I don't want that to happen. Um, I'd rather control if I'm going to allow that to happen. And I know that it will be half dry. Will it work? Will it not? I'm just going to avoid it by starting down here and doing a little bit of planning. And then I might whip my hair dryer out and ensure that these edges are dry. It'll only be a 30 second dry so that when I start to paint, I don't get any bleeding. Having said that, bleeding sometimes can look fabulous. I'm going to mix up a colour. Mm, okay, I'm going to zoom out so you can see my palette. And um, they're beautiful and orange, these um, flowers. You could positively paint them. If you're into realism, then uh, this is your opportunity to add some detail or some shadow or um, something that satisfies you. I just love the design all aspects of negative painting and, and the idea that you can lead the viewer through your painting. Um, no, that doesn't really make sense, does it? I just like negative painting. I was trying to think of a good reason. Um, I just find it a bit more interesting. I suppose because in the beginning I just painted everything positively and then one day discovered negative painting and thought, oh, my gosh, that's what artists use all the time. I think it seems to, I think it took my art to the next level by negatively painting. And so from there on I was hooked and so I just negatively paint a lot. Um, maybe I should find something else to move on to. We don't know. I'm going to stop talking about that and start talking about what colour I could enhance the amount of orange that's there and use the orange in my palette. So, for example, I'm just going to put this here. These are my options. Small brush. Here's my orange from last week. I'm going to add a little bit more water. Here's my orange from last week. If I add a stack of water to that, it will be pale. But for now, if I add... This, if I glaze this onto here, I will make these um, pop, make these flowers pop just by a tonal shift. Then, the, but this tonal shift would be subtle. What I could do is turn this into more of a lemon orange. So I have a quick look at that. A little bit of lemon, a little bit of lemon, and I'll add a tiny bit of orange to that. So here I've got a really lemony yellow orange. And if I add that to that, it's I don't like yellow. So that finishes that one. So my other option is to add a little more magenta. Just a little bit. I'm going to add it in little bits, a bit like salt. Can't take it out. Add it in little bits is a great way to go. So instantly I'm loving it. I'm going to add more. So my background colour is going to be very similar to the colour of the flowers. It will be warmer because I'm adding a little bit of magenta. Ooh, we could have a whole discussion on whether it's actually warmer because magenta is really a neutral colour, but I'm going to argue that I am warming it up because the two meet in the middle of the colour wheel. Ooh, if anyone wants more explanation about that, I really would love to go on about it, but I shall 
forge ahead instead. Here's my beautiful mix and yeah, I'm just loving the combination of this ready orange with my blue and that. Anyway, I'm going to uh, just go for it now. This needs way more water. I'm going to try and hold my painting up so I don't make a mess of it. I'm adding a stack of water. So I've got a really watery mix. Glazing with a watery mix is much easier than glazing with thicker paint. Right, so there it is in the pale version. That's the full tone and that's the light tone. And that's what's going to be added here. All right, get rid of this and start. And there's so many moments when you're painting and I'm enjoying aspects of it. And, and I do find that I get to a certain point and I'm like, okay, don't kill the painting. And then I get nervous and that's not going to help me. So I'm going to try to not focus on the fact that I might uh, ruin it and just go for it and switch my head game into enjoy the process and um, enjoy the beautiful action of um, adding some color. I'm going to put water down first. I'm going to zoom in a little so you can see that. Uh, if I zoom to that side, you'll be able to see the palette as well. There. All oh, right, that looks good. I'm going to, st I can paint this whole, oh, I just dripped water. I'm going to get rid of it because it'll, it'll surprise me and go somewhere I don't want. I'm going to paint around this section here so I know I'm not going to touch the butterfly for now. I can paint here and I might switch into there and I'm still not touching the butterfly till I get to there and that's dry. So I can paint this and this. Yeah, that's dry. And um, I'll do that last and it might be dry in time. May not need the uh, dryer at all. Okay, water. First, I'm not going close to the image. Move that blue so I don't accidentally pick it up. I'm using the orange. I'm using the size triple zero because it's going to allow me to go into those beautiful points there. So I'm using the point to hit the line and the belly to come down and hit the water. That way I get a transition from this uh, medium tone out to a very light tone. Okay, more water, putting water on the edge basically. I don't need the water to go to the edge of the flower, in, quite, in fact quite the opposite. If I keep the edge dry, I get a lovely darker tone and then it transitions out to nothing. And I'm going to go here next, move it around to suit my hand, water. I'm doing it in sector by sector. It's a bit of um, blue stuff. I've, I think I've accidentally splattered some blue. Probably won't notice that at the end. Tip to do detail. Belly. To add mass. I think the other thing about um, adding some negative detail to these flowers is it's going to make them make a little bit more sense because some of the shapes are not clear because it's a continuous line drawing. I'm going to wash that off to nothing. I don't want to draw attention at the bottom. Moisture, moisture, moisture. And I've prepared another sector and I'm coming in. I often do that. I start out and go in. I think I get a little bit of a, a focus happening with my hand by sweeping inwards. Or maybe I enjoy the quick sweep and coming down to the fine sweep. But I do find I do that a lot. 
Um, I really like that that's uh, been left, so I'm going to leave it. Oh, did you see that big drip? Right, water. Ooh. You could be thinking about stuff you want to leave alone. There might be bits and pieces of your background if you did that lovely splattering wash. Bits and pieces that you like. And you can um, leave them. Don't paint over them. The other thing I'd like to do as I'm painting, particularly with a negative painting like this, is there'll be bits that are just interesting and don't necessarily make sense. And I'm stunned at how you can just leave them. No one ever notices, except you. And you're the only one who needs to be satisfied. Again, I'm going to wash that off to nothing. I don't want attention at the edges. Come back around. Now, my paint paper is um, buckling. I'll just put it over here. See how I can stick my finger under it there, but I can't fit it under there. It's buckled because I didn't tape it down. So that means that uh, I've got this mountain and a valley and a valley, and it's just a good moment to be conscious of your mountains and valleys because the water is traveling quickly towards the edge and drying faster at the um, peak. Just a good, if you don't like backgrounds, this is an important moment to be noticing your um, rate at which it, it is drying. Now, do I want to, yeah, I think it's logical that I keep going around there. So I'm going to go around here. Turning it right round to suit my left-handedness. Bit of water finishes the sector. And I'm just going to remove the water and tickle that down. I don't want too much water there. I want it to go off to nothing. So it's a barely damp brush that I'm smoothing this out with. Don't want to introduce more water. Okay, putting it back in position. Oh, it went out of focus again, stupid camera. Come on. Did that help? Nope. I'll just see if I can get it to refocus. There. Gosh, it's... There. Okay, it seems to have found itself again. Okay, now I've got a line of this beautiful orange that is incredibly closely related to this orange that's in the middle. It's just much warmer. It's got more magenta. Natasha says, in your preparation painting, you had purples, yeah, and other colours. Are we doing other colours? Yeah, I very likely will. I So thank you for asking that. Um, I made up a purple, so I, I went completely differently. I used the magenta and the blue and made it a purple, so it, it gave quite a different feel to it, didn't it? I'll just put them side by side there. Um. <laughs> And my camera is back to front. So, um, yes, it's quite a different look. So, um, and Karen says, a negative painting makes it, doesn't it? It's drawing focus to the base of my painting. So, yes, absolutely, um, Natasha, well noticed. I used a lot of purple in this background and I added it last, um, I think. <laughs> hard to remember but actually I did that on a video which I'm in the middle of um, editing so I'll be able to tell um so yes I might add some purple to this um uh to I think I did that on this one I'm so glad you're making me think about it I think I did that on this one because I wanted to incorporate more of the blue into the background I I felt like it needed more cohesion in the color so that's why I introduced some of that blue by making a purple and then um, adding it to the background. Every painting is like a little different journey. Every painting 
um, is a little bit different. Right, I've, hopefully your eye is going on this journey now. It's being drawn in around here and I want the viewer to come up, and not go off in that direction. I want the viewer to turn the corner and come over here. So I'm going to jump to this space and I'll do this second. I want some focus to be drawn in over here because I want you to come in, you, you as in any viewer, to come in and, and go over here and come up to my butterfly. It's a subtle thing that I'm doing. I'm, you know, I just have all these theories on it and I just like to uh, try them and sometimes they I totally pull it off. Anyway, I'm going into this section here now. Um, I don't need much water. It's quite detailed, but I'm going to put a little bit of water in there and I'm going to need to be fast. So plenty of paint. Make sure you've got plenty of paint before you begin. Water in there. And this lovely triple zero is being fabulous. I've chosen the right size for this spot. You don't want it too big and you don't want it too small. Too big and you've got too much water. Waste too much paint or introduce too much water. And too small and you're just constantly reloading. And the reload slows you down. And too much water means... Too many back runs. I love having a range of brush sizes for exactly these moments. Oh, that goes right into there. I'm going to take it right in. I'm <laughs> unable to talk while I'm doing the tiny detail. There, done. And because I wanted to get that quickly done before coming back to here, because there's a wet patch there. Right, I'm going to come, turn it around so I can bring my brush close to that blue. If I'm lucky, that's going to look beautiful. Turn it around again so that I've always got the tip pointing away from me. And I find that's the best way for my hand and mind, I guess, my hand and my eye. I get the best hand to eye coordination, in fact. I'm just going to bring that blue. I'm touching the blue the tiniest bit. I could leave a little gap. Or if you touch it, I it does um, activate the blue a tiny bit. I don't mind that. Okay, bringing it down, belly of the brush makes you fast. Tip of the brush is for detail. Okay, quickly grab some water and extend that out. A bit more water. And I'm going to continue up to this section here, up to there. Reload with the triple zero. There's all these little white dots that I've missed and I just went back in and fixed them up which could mean that I just introduced a stack of back runs I won't know for a minute. It's the nature of back runs you don't know immediately. It takes a second. Okay dry my brush off and just gently tease that out with the tiniest amount of dampness on my brush. Okay, how's that going? I just wonder if I can bring that down. And yeah, okay. I really want to fill in that little bit while I'm thinking of it. I like that stem to pop. So if you outline something, you're likely to make give it a little more importance Right, I'm going to switch to this little dry brush, wet it. This is my little tiny liner and there's no paint on it, just a tiny bit of dampness. I didn't like the intensity of that section. Everywhere else had water, so I'm going to 
in fact take some off I've painted it and now I'm taking reducing the intensity because it was more intense than all the other oranges there I want to take it back till it matches the intensity around it I'm just dragging my brush through it because it was quite wet and putting it on my page I've made a mistake there but I, I bet I won't notice that at the end all righty I haven't added any paint there and I feel like there's a bit of a, a disconnect so I want to add the tinsiest bit turn that round and do this sector here water and I'm going to come in close because I only want a little bit of tone there tiny bit I'm coming in really close with my tip because that will reduce the tone of the orange I'm adding then when I add the orange the tiniest bit that I'm adding becomes instantly three tones lighter because it hits the water whereas everywhere else I left a big gap just make that give that bud a little more importance By outlining and I quite like that wet in wet there I'm going to tip it and um, it will just travel down and if I allow it to just I'm just going to give it a minute while it's traveling it's ever so delicately traveling oh missed a bit there ever so it does that beautiful thing that watercolor does that's so transient does these little feathery beautiful things and then dissipates into the water I think that's long enough let's see this part of my paper is up it's um so that means that water will rush back in that way and um so I'm going to whip the hairdryer onto that because I haven't um taped my paper down this is why you do put your tape tape your paper down if you want to avoid what I'm doing okay one second I'll mute So if I just hold that up, you can see that I got a back run here because that water flew back, flew, <laughs> that water flowed back into my paint and then I got these, uh, the beginnings of back runs. It's not too bad, but here I've controlled it by drying it. I don't really like drying much, but I could see that this was sitting up and I knew what was going to happen. Uh, the other thing I'll just mention that's rather delightful is that this pen that I used is water soluble. So as I touch it with quite a wet brush, it's um, doing that beautiful uh, flow thing. It's um, dissolving just a little bit of the edge and flowing out. Love that about those um, anything that's water soluble. Now, just uh, rechecking for a moment. It's coming in. I haven't added too much tone or um, detail over here so that hopefully your eye comes back in and uh, around. I'm pretty happy with that. Now, I've got this little bit here where I, I'll just zoom in to make that a little easier to see. Zoom in more. And just while I've got this paint, available and the exact tone um i made a mistake here and overpainted, so i could correct that with the black marker but i've got the orange and i think what i'll do instead is see whether or not with a tiny little bit of orange i can go over that it actually i think was supposed to be part of that flower but instead i'm going to give it a little bit of orange and just mask it and I won't know till that's dry whether that's fine I've got this little 
bit here that is um I think needs a bit I think it doesn't look like a flower so I'm going to add a little bit of orange here so I'm using the full strength of the paint get it down and then switch to that little um liner brush to feather it out oh need a tiny bit more moisture I added a little bit more and then removed it and that way I will hopefully match the tone. I don't want to draw attention to that part. It's not my favorite part of the butterfly. And again, these are the sort of things that I can correct a little more later if they bother me. Okay, that's better. I was aiming to match tone and I think I did. There's a couple more butterflies up the top. <laughs> more butterflies, more flowers up the top. So, um, just going to pause and look at the other one. I was a bit, um, what happened with this one is that I made this yucky mess. Um, now that happened because I got a back run and I attempted to fix it in the middle of the back run. And what that meant was that all the layers just mixed together and glazing purple on orange can, you can get away with that, but mixing purple in with the orange that's there turned into this khaki bit that I really don't like. Um, so firstly, I need to control the water when I do the top of this one. It's really important. If I'd mucked up one of the ones down the bottom, maybe you wouldn't notice it so much. But up here, the antennae are going to go in. It's a really important part. So I really want to control it. So I think what I'll do is paint it and dry it with the hairdryer immediately. Because again, my paper is, is buckling. If I show you on the edge, can you see how buckled it is? Hard to tell. Anyway, the point is I'm going to control it. I'm going to negatively paint this final flower and with water here, then I'm going to get the um, hairdryer to it immediately. Water over the whole sector, but not too close to the flower because I don't need to. Coming in with my beautiful, delightful little one and just tickling that black and it's doing a beautiful thing where it hits the water and does what watercolour is designed to do. I'm going to tickle the blue, touch the blue. You could leave a gap if you don't want the blue to move. Oops, missed a bit. I'll deal with that in a second, but I'll finish what I'm doing and then deal with my mistake. Finish this first. Okay. Just going to, there's orange on that brush. I'm just going to feather that out so that it's a smoother transition. And I don't really want that, so a bit of water. I had a bit of dry brush going on, so I've just gotten rid of it with water. I need to remove, just turn it around. I made a mistake and went into the flower. So I've got my flat brush and I'm trying to, so it's all wet. With my flat brush, I'm attempting to lift it. Okay, wetting my flat brush now. I did dry first and now I've got wet. Just gently touching it with those bristles. Okay, I've reduced it sufficiently for it not to be noticeable. I'm going to grab my hairdryer again and because instantly that water is going, Ew! I'm going to dry it. I'll mute. Okay, I'll zoom out because we need to 
decide while that paint is perfect, uh, while the tones on my palette are perfect at the moment, I need to decide if there are any changes to be made. So it's uh, watercolour is quite different to other mediums. I'm just putting my palette in view in that we can keep the palette absolutely, but the water evaporates over time, like even within a day, and when you come back to it, you won't have the same tones, whereas right now I've got that exact orange in that exact tone and I need to, if at all possible, complete any of the area of the painting that needs um, that orange because once it's dried and you reactivate it, it's not the exact same. Um, so I'm just having a good look and just having a think, is there anywhere else I want to add that orange? If I want to make it darker, that's fine. Oh, I left, missed a bit there. There you go. I'm just going to finish that bit. If I gently touch the orange, if I gently touch the orange, if I gently touch the black pen, it just does this beautiful fuzzy release. Okay, switching to my damp liner brush to feather it out. And then I reduce the intensity of my orange but I don't introduce water. I'm just feathering that out a little bit. And so then I need to do a little more, bit of water, and come back in with the orange there. And then reevaluate again. Have I missed anything? Or do I want more of that beautiful orange anyway? Okay, I'm just feathering out and I'm going to use water to feather out. This has a lot of water on it. So because my paper is so crinkled, I'm just deciding whether or not I need to – I'm putting it on an angle. If I turn it on the side – I can get, I can estimate the um, what the water's like. Is it particularly shiny? Have I introduced much water? And if I come up a little closer, I can sometimes see whether or not the water is moving back in because it's really wet there. I can't touch it because all that will do is leave a mucky version of a thumbprint. I think it's pretty good. All right. We're ready for the stencil. It's 11 o'clock. I'm going to have a big stretch because this is really, really cool. So I'm going to use the stencil for a couple of things. I'm going to use the stencil to, because it's a clear sheet of acetate, I'm going to use the stencil to work out where exactly will I place my uh, antennae. I'm going to use the stencil to remove. Oh, right. We didn't need to dry it. That's wonderful. Your question to yourself is, is the butterfly as dark as you would like? Because it's quite nice at this stage. Do the stencils once and then it's done. And we are going to get this butterfly finished today. Um, oh, I just noticed that Philip said looks so very good. Oh, thank you, Philip. I love that. And um, delightfully, I'm pretty pleased with it. <laughs> and I'm sure that everyone could uh, um, <laughs> empathise with me there because as artists, boy, are we our uh, harshest critics. So for me to say that, I'm pretty pretty damn pleased, um, probably because I've got this beautiful humming going on between these complementary colours, the blue and the orange, and it start to... Um, It'll start to fix up. Hey, Jean, thanks for joining us this morning. Hope you're okay. <laughs> um, stencil time. I find stencils awesome. Now, first thing I want to do is, is get a piece. <laughs> That's the post-it note my husband wrote me. Ah. Uh, 
get a piece of bank paper. So this is the paper that I've been using the whole time. It's called Bank Layout Pad. It's just cheap version of tracing paper. I can get rid of that pad. I'm lay it on, on my butterfly so that I can get an outline very quickly, very quickly. This gives me the size. I'll put a line there so I know that goes off the edge. Very quick outline so that I can now work out. Oh, I might put the body in as well. And then I'm going to refer to the image. I'm actually going to refer to this image, but you could refer to any butterfly image. You could, uh, if I move that there and put that there, they're both there. Right. I'm going to draw in some of these beautiful details. This is the moment at which you go, okay, will I add, subtract? We're actually going to subtract. We, will I remove um, the internal parts? You could remove the external parts. This is your opportunity to remove as much as you would like. I like this major section here. There, and then I'm just copying these marks here that come out. There's one like that. There's a little thing over there and a little thing over there. You can, of course, put in as much detail as you like. Goes along there and goes down. Oh, and that goes in like that. Uh, and then I'll put in a little one there. Now, because we're dealing with a symmetrical object, I don't need to do the other side. I'm going to do one and then I'm going to flip it when I'm using my stencil. That's my big tip to you with uh, using stencils on a symmetrical object. You don't need to do both sides. I'm going to continue and add a little bit of detail on the bottom. You could actually spend a really long time and remove masses of detail if you wanted to. I'm going to put in a little bit there. Or No, I won't do that one because as soon as you introduce that, I really need to do all of them. So anyway, you could do all of them. You could, um, it doesn't much matter. Ooh, I might add a little bit of detail for the body. I'll see how I go. I'll do one, two, three, like threes. And maybe a little bit on the thorax. I did negatively paint some detail on the body, so I'll see. I negatively painted the eyes. You could um, stencil out the eyes if you wanted to. There's so many options here. Okay, so we're ready. I'm just going to do quick antennae that will make me think. I'm not going to remove the antennae, but it will make me think about the placement in advance. Okay, get rid of that one. Get rid of that one. I now need the piece of acetate. Here's my acetate. I'm just organizing myself to get the cutting mat. But as I say, any piece of cardboard would work just fine. Um, that's my original piece. I wonder if I can just fit it on that one. Yes, I can. Right, I don't need a fresh piece of acetate. It'll fit. No problem. Okay. I'm going to leave that lovely shiny bit because it helps you see. I could adjust it so it's less shiny. But, in fact, if I leave the shine on, it might help you see where the details are. Oopsie. Okay. Need to bring this closer to my body. And, in fact, I'm going to stand up. It'll make it easier for me. I'm going to get a piece of tape. So it doesn't move during this process. Okay. There. Tape.
tape is on the acetate on the paper and on the board and I think I'll do another one because I did find it moved right I'm standing that give me easier access and I'm just going to cut out changing angles so many times I've considered buying some special tool for this job you know when you're watching social media and an ad pops up for um and it'll be some sort of cutting tool But in the end, a good old Stanley knife just does hundreds of things for you. And sometimes I do think I can own too much stuff. And the problem with owning too much stuff is that you forget you've got the stuff. Just slowly removing without hurting myself. I'm quite um, enjoying this Part of the awesomeness of YouTube Live is that I don't have to worry about anyone hurting themselves with a Stanley knife, whereas um, when you're teaching, you have to be super conscious of the safety of your students. So I've never done this in class for this exact reason, that you might hurt yourself. And... On YouTube Live, there's only me to worry about. I'm going to include some of these little extra bits up here. You can see I'm being quite crude about the shapes. It's one of those many times that you satisfy yourself. If you want to be accurate about the anatomy of the butterfly, then do that. If you want to do one section, five sections, always completely satisfy yourself. But if you're a perfectionist, you need to work on ways to limit the time that you do it. And one of the things I've learned, my mantra now is get it done, better done, better done because the process is where the pleasure is. So if I get it done, I find I really enjoy it. I'm gonna move that paper that might make it easier for you to see the shapes. I'm now negatively removing the shapes on the bottom. And I decided not to do that one. I decided to do this one. And as I mentioned, I only need to do one side. I do like the idea of putting in some of these segments on the butterfly's abdomen. There's actually way more than three, but I love the oddness of the three. I love all those theories about three in art. Just trying to get that one up with my blade. It's quite hard to see where I've cut. There's going to be someone who's watching and has a way better method than me, but you can see I only do this about once, a, once in a blue moon, and therefore Natasha says, I love that you have more shapes for this one. Yeah, it's um, awesome to oh that one didn't come out there it's awesome to change it up i think artists are so often oh intelligent people and this is one of the many ways you entertain yourself by um 
introducing new ideas. I think I'll add that little, oh, I just totally, no, I won't. I just uh, made a big mistake. Right, I'm just running my finger into these holes and checking that they're gone because it's really hard to see. So I'm just doing it by feel, 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 feel. All right, now we can remove. The removing part is going to be so fast. Just get rid of my tape. The removing is going to be done in, <laughs> actually, I'd like to say five minutes, but last time I estimated the time that it takes me something, I got it very wrong. Here's my painting. Here's my stencil. Lay it in place. And as I say, we're going to one side. I'm just going to double check that looks good. Now, the um, parts of the on the abdomen don't line up, but I could. I might remove the parts of on the wing and then shift that over when it comes to the ab abdomen. Or, and in fact, I could shift it down. Oh, cool. Right. Just lining that up. This mark here was on the top wing and this is on the bottom. So maybe I'll do the top and then I'll slide it down to do the bottom because I, I do have a mark there that indicates the top from the bottom. So I'm going to place it there. Oh, it looks lovely just like that. It's going to look so lovely in a second. Here's my sponge. I mentioned at the beginning, right, I'm just going to move that for a second, that I've got a towel and a jar of water. I'm going to protect my painting because... I don't want any splashes on it at this stage. And this is what the, no oh man, do you believe I just did that? I don't want to introduce any red. I just rewash it. Okay, don't want splatters on my painting. Really squeezing out everything. Okay, jar. Okay, I'm drying my hand because I don't want to introduce any splattery bits. And there's no excess moisture. Don't want excess moisture. Right. Here we go. The quickest part. Sponge ready. The tissues. I'm just going to make sure they're ready because then I can be fast. The trick is not to let any moisture go under your stencil. So this hand is holding my stencil right in place. This I'm going to wet it and then dry it with the tissues. That way I will limit the amount of moisture that um, travels anywhere. Okay, holding it down, top wing first. <laughs> I can see that I missed a bit on my stencil. And dry. Oh, wow, well, no, I went off the edge. Oh, I totally just... <laughs> oh gosh look at all the blue coming off right can you see that I missed that little bit of um I made two mistakes I've missed that little bit there so turn the sponge over just get that little bit and back to the tissue dry I'm going to dry that because I'm going to be switching it over to the other side, so I may as well dry it really well now. So you can see, I don't know if you can see, little bits of moisture got underneath. Yeah, I'm not sure I love, I'm so excited in the process, and now I'm not sure I completely love it. It'll look better in a second when we do the other side. Um, right, so I'm going to dry. <laughs> I'm trying to be careful and not make a mess of my painting. I don't know whether you can all see what I just totally did to my painting. This might turn out to be one of those days where I'll change the title of this YouTube tutorial to How to Fix Your Mistakes. I totally <laughs> went off the edge and removed a section of my um, butterfly wing and added blue to the, so that was, um, 
that was um, silly. That's because I did not use a fresh piece of um, acetate. I should have used a fresh piece. I should have gone bigger than the butterfly. Anyway, isn't that the nature of art making? Learn crap you didn't want to know. Okay. Towel, jar. I'm going to wash that off. I don't want to be putting paint on. I want to be removing. So just squeeze it out again. Dry my hand. Don't want drips. Checking that's not too wet. Okay. I'm going to stencil the bottom half of the the bottom wing, that is. I'm going to move it down a little. And I can see that I'm going to accidentally sponge off some stuff from the top. I'm going to have to block off. Now, I put that there. I'm going to block off so I can't make another silly mistake. Block that off. Just lift it up a little so I can see that I want to place it there. Then I'll block it off. Sponge off. Oh, is that where I want it? Sponge. Tissue. So the tissue is not only drying the stencil, it's also um, removing the tissue. It says, you can make a baby butterfly right there on the end. It's, um, I love your suggestion. It's also an awesome way to make butterflies. Um, you could stencil out the whole, and I've done that over and over, stencil a whole butterfly and then paint it, uh, then paint a background and stencil out a butterfly shape. Okay, I'm drying it off with my tissue. Oh, that looks better. Now the bottom's done. Oh, thank goodness. Part of what's hard about doing something on YouTube is that it's like an opportunity to, to make mistakes in front of people. My favourite. And now the beauty of just having a symmetrical object is that I can just flip my stencil over. Oh, having said that, I do have this little issue in that my wings are not perfectly um opposite each other, as in they're not perfectly symmetrical. Now, I included that one there. Right, I'm just going to do the best I can. Um, right, I'm going to use tape to adjust the shape because the alternative is that I bring this wing up. Yeah, I think I'll get tape. And change the shape. Oops, bigger bit. Tape the top, just reducing the size so that I can place it there. I'm trying to make it as I'm going to stand up so I can see. So excuse my head going in the um, in the middle there. I need to. I want to make it symmetrical. I'm just taking my time with this one to put it in position there. Now, I'm not going to bother to rewash the sponge. It's I only used one side. And um, go for it. I'm standing. Oh, it's a little wet on that side. Lots of tissues. Oops, I moved the stencil. <laughs> Look at all the blue coming off. I'm going to remove it carefully because this tape may have attached a little bit. Nope. Oh, good. Ah, oh, so nearly done. It's such a beautiful method. Ah, oh, thank you, Liz. I love you writing that. Uh, now I'm going to tape off again so I can't accidentally make 
Where did I get to? Oh, I didn't do that one there. Um, there, so I can't accidentally do that and move it down to line it up. So <laughs> apologies for my head. There, 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 there. Bit lower. It's because the wings aren't perfectly aligned. I'm just going to turn the sponge over to the clean side. And tissues. Okay. Oh, the tape stuck. <laughs> the tape stuck to the wet bit. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, no. Oh, all right. Okay. So these are showing up brilliantly on one side because it was so much darker. At the beginning, I was talking about how this um, section, I got a little bit of a back run and I had the option of glazing that more to match up to that one. But this side turned out to be much lighter than this side. And um, I'm just going to go with it because I don't want to redo the stencils and I'm loving the stencil on one side. And, hey, quite nice that it might be more jumping out um, on one side than the other side. Maybe that makes it a little more interesting rather than being perfectly symmetrical and it is art making after all. Uh, now, I'm just going to use this to decide, does this go on acetate? Yeah, sufficiently. I'm just going to use the stencil to decide where my um, antennae are going to go. So I'm um, apologies that that um, – oh, thanks, Tiffany. I'm, I just put it on an angle there. You can see that I'm just deciding where will the um, – will I – so I want your eye to come in, travel around, come up, and I could make this antennae go straight, but that might encourage your eye to go up or I go to either side and I'm just doing it on the stencil to um, make that decision. A lot of antennae have little lumps at the end. I can see from this image that it's just a little fatter at the end and it's really super thin down here and then gets thicker as it goes along. So I might do, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll, no, I like the idea you just go flick, one line flick, one line flick. And that helps me decide. I'm getting my black pen and I'm going to commit to the antennae now. Here we go. Uh, this is a black brush pen. It's a Tombow. I'm loving it. I have um, tried out lots of brands and uh, each brand I try I like and then I find one that's even better. So really liking Tombow. I'm going to go that way and that way and I'm going to start close to the head and then flick out like that and I'm going to thicken the end ever so delicately. One, turn it around to make it easier for my hand and again I'm going to practice going just practice the action and then commit. Oh it's not quite as nice. It's not something I can do twice that's for sure. Okay, turn it back round, and we're up to the final stretch, which is where we come in with some black marker detail. So I'm going to go and show you the other one that I did. At the beginning, I mentioned that I just did an auto outline, and did I love it? Did I not? Oh, by the way, I got them to fuzz by um, wetting the background, uh, and then when I drew the antenna on it, it fuzzed out a little bit. That's quite lovely. I haven't risked that on this one. I That was a good risk that I'm not going to do again. Now, I'm wondering whether or not just outlining is a little bit straightforward, and uh, the other option thing to think about is does it need outlining should I bother to add any black at all um now since uh oh you'll forgive me washing my sponge out while I'm talking because 
That's a staining pigment. I love this sponge. You know, when people give you things, you form a greater attachment to them when they were given in a moment of, you know, I was going to say love, but that's a little more intense than I mean. You know, just a generous moment. So this sponge feels like a, it's full of generosity. I'm just going to get rid of the sponge. Okay, cleaned it and now it's not stained with blue. Okay. I am going to do the black marker. I, um, I don't know whether I'm convinced that it absolutely does need the extra, <laughs> but I did uh, advertise this um, as a, a butterfly with black marker. So, so many beautiful options here. There's all this internal um, detail, these black lines. I could do that. I could outline our beautiful lifting off with black marker, but definitely not going to do that because I really like that soft look. Um, but I do need to, um, but I do want to add some black towards the edges. And maybe what I'll start with is not a continuous line. Maybe. Right, okay, I'm going to just start now. Maybe what I will start with is adding the black line and making that fatter. Um, there's lots of little bits around the edge that need covering. So I'm going to use the black marker to that point. I'm going to go thick to thin and then be symmetrical. Because I'm using textured watercolour paper, it's rough, the marker is giving a bit of a rough edge. So that's why I'm going over it a couple of times. Yeah, that does help, I think. Okay, now I'm going to come down the edge and go thick to thin, use it as an opportunity to add a little bit of detail. As I say, if I want to join those lines up, that will be easy to do. Now, I'm going to be symmetrical. This is a nice opportunity to um, fix things. Oh, I need to fix that before I put any marker on it. Now, trusty flat brush to try and fix this. Bit of water. The first thing I'm going to do is see if I can lift it from the background. And, of course, it's a staining colour, so it's going to be extremely limited in its um, – I'm just re-wetting and touching. It's going to be ext extremely limited in the amount that will come off because staining pigments enter the fibre – into the fibres of your page, washing it off, and don't come out. Exactly like a staining pigment on your clothes enters the fibres of your clothing and does not come off. Tiniest little bits are coming off when I do that. So there's a real limit. I mean, I could sit here and scrub and scrub and scrub, and see if I can get it off. The alternative is to paint a little bit of orange on it, which will reduce its intensity. I need to add a little bit of blue to my wing. But as we know with watercolour, um, that I will introduce a line and it will be incredibly difficult to um, match up. So I think what I might do is lift off and here, disguise it a little bit and then see if I can lift off over there and make it symmetrical. Uh, Philip says, instead of going all round, can you do the outline or just the top or the bottom edges as almost a tiny shading element? Ooh. So, um, oh, do you mean on these ones? Oh, that's a beautiful idea. If that's what you meant... Do you mean add a little bit like that? I'll do 
bit and a bit and see if I love it. That's... Oh, yeah. Philip, thank you. Brilliant. I'm just going to add little touches. And it is, it's looking exactly like a little shadow. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Little tinsy bits. And then I'm going to go over here and try and replicate it. Just trying to match up that. Mm, just putting little tiny bits, a little bit and then a little bit. <laughs> Philip says, yep. I wouldn't have thought of that. I love that thinking. That is creative thinking. And a little bit and a little bit. It might be hard to see on the screen, but if I hold it up, it just is adding a subtle but lovely element to it. I need to fix those lines there because they went thick. I'm making just dragging the pen along to thin them out. I'm making, I'm making it worse. I'm going to stop doing that. Um, thank you. That was that was delightful suggestion. Right, I'm going to finish fixing that. So I'm going to use my flat brush, grab a couple of tissues, wet my flat brush, remove the excess moisture, move all excess moisture, and I need to disguise that shape. And I know that doesn't exist on the butterfly at all, but I need to attempt to make it look like it's a part intended washing it off and just remove that there and then I'm going to match it up on the other side wash my brush remove excess moisture I'm rubbing it on the towel first and then the tissue and if that goes to there that goes to there just going to match that up. Might rename the video Problem Solving in Watercolor. Wash my brush because you want to get the paint off and not put it back on. How's that? Have I improved it? Have I ruined it? Mm. When it's dry, I'll add a bit of the black marker. Oh, some final details. We're on the home stretch, tiny bit to go. Where to add? I'm just going to examine this one to decide where to add. Right, I want to fix up. Yeah, that's what I'm going to add because I want to um, tighten up those edges where I wasn't being careful. I'm going to go on the outside first. Outside. No, it needs more, unfortunately. I'll do a bit and a bit. And broken lines I'm going for just to avoid my constant desire to do even lines. When we're growing up, we're always if you're anything like me, your goal was to draw. Um, thanks, Liz. Your goal was to draw evenly. Actually, colour in was such a common activity, which is kind of annoying because you're just colouring in someone else's art. All uh, right. I don't know whether I'll put black here because the bottom of my body is a little wonky. Oh, no, better still. Oh, I forgot to remove the little um, markings on the body. Oh, I think I'm going to do that as well. Uh, yeah, because I've got this little bit here and my sponge I already cleaned off. Perfect. And it's still quite damp. I'm going to turn it around so I can't accidentally remove some that stuff. There's the little bits of the body. 
clean tissues, press hard. Okay, how's that? Thanks, Natasha. Oh, yeah, I like it. And that would be easy to cover if I um, didn't like it. And now I'm liking these black bits here. My eye was drawn to it in a good way. That's a good way uh, also of working out whether or not a painting is finished. Do your eyes go to a spot and sit there and go, oh, that's lovely, or do your eyes go to a spot and go, eh, what's that? Right, I'm going to match this one with this one. I'm really noticing how uneven my butterfly is. And fix that line and fix that line. And again there. I'm enjoying the broken line. I think that's better than the consistent line. Oh, my goodness. Oh, thank you, Karen. That's wonderful. Oh, I think we get to sign it now. I uh, think it deserves to be signed in watercolour. I like to use the little um, liner brush, and I've got the colours on my palette. If I sign it in blue, it will could draw a little bit of attention. Do I want that? Do I not want that? Or I could be thinking um, I like a bit of blue being drawn down here. Or if I don't really want my signature to be noticed, I could go for the orange. And maybe I don't want. Maybe I want the butterfly to be the complete hero. I've got a little bit of orange. And I'm just searching for the bit of paper. I just remembered <laughs> that at the beginning I said I was going to demonstrate how to do this on one of my paintings. But it doesn't matter. Just seen that painting there and thought, ooh, I remember. I had a plan. Now, I'm just searching for a piece of paper. This will do to put the colour on. Oh, way too um, pale. That was from the pale mix in the middle. So I'm going to pick up some of this thick magenta, pop it over there, a little bit of that orange. Oh, maybe that'll be nice. It's thicker but still flowing, not too dark, a little bit more of that orange. Okay, I'm going to sign it, committing to the paper. Marion, reload. That's the problem with small brushes. Reload, reload. Marion. Chapman. Worth focusing while you sign your name. It's really hard uh, to try and correct it. One time I was um, painting away and I listened to podcasts in the background. I find it very uh, soothing to listen to um, interesting um, conversations and so I was um, signing and not focusing on what I was writing and I wrote some words so I wrote Marianne and then I wrote whatever word was on the podcast instead of Chapman. It's really hard if you've signed your painting in a really light place uh, to try and cover it up uh, but I had to just scrub it out that's what how I solved it I scrubbed it out and signed it in another place because um, I had to scrub out the whole thing. Um, I cannot think, I'm feeling like it's quite complete. I think that uh, you could use that suggestion that if you're thinking, oh, it just needs something, then does it really? I mentioned at the beginning that we could talk briefly at the end about um, the warm, cool balance, and I think that I'm pretty satisfied with the how the cool subject matter is popping because we've given it this um, warm background. And it was a warm background when it was orange, which, as we discussed earlier, was, is the complementary colour to blue. And then I further warmed up the background by adding another layer of an, a warmer version of that orange. Um, so I think the warm, cool thing is working nicely. I think the um, – thank you, Philip. I think that the other thing that helps incorporate this subject matter is that there was orange underneath tiniest little bits can still be seen on this wing but I think because there was a key color that was laid down first that that helps 
I'm just going to grab the other one for a second um, to go back to Natasha's question about the, the purple. So I went for quite a different look. I'm just going to put them side by side. I'll just zoom out so that's a little easier to see. Oops, that's my remote dropping down there. I'm just going to put them like that. So um, I've intensified the blue and I think um, – I quite like it, <laughs> I think, because um, I really am loving the, the phthalo blue. This has way more of a green tinge to it. Um, so is that to do with that blue? So um, uh, was it the same tube? I don't think so. But I'll be able to tell because <laughs> I videoed it. And as I say, there's a um, video coming, which is on the creation of this one. And uh, it's a half sheet, whereas this one was a quarter sheet. And I changed the design in a few ways. Um, there are a couple of things about this that are bothering me. I dripped water here and have splattered um, the black. But I think uh, for now, we've been sitting here creating for an hour and three quarters. And it's a good moment to hop up and set it aside. And um, I find it takes me a week. I'm really surprised about how long it can take me. I'm going to go and put this in my press. That's the other thing that I do in um, one of the videos I've just made it just made is show you the press. And um, I painted some ballet shoes, which is what I'd like to uh, paint next week. So I'm going to put the image of the ballet shoes on my Facebook page, Marion Chapman Artist Sydney, for next week's tutorial. I'm hopefully going to get some new software and I hope to get that organised this afternoon. Uh, thank you to all those people who said that they would be interviewed on my channel because next week I will do the ballet shoes and grapple with the new software, which hopefully will make it even better for you. Um, but if there's someone else, I do would would really like um, a couple more people uh, to volunteer to uh, be interviewed. What I'm thinking uh, in terms of being interviewed for, it won't be next week, it'll be the week after, is you just need to be available Thursday week. You need to be available for this time period, 10 till 12. That seems to be the period of time that it goes for. Natasha says, thanks so much. It's been great learning this process. I'm behind, but really in forward to, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Natasha. Um, what you need to think about if you'd like to be interviewed is a painting that you'd like feedback on. So you need to be prepared to show your face on, <laughs> on YouTube. You need to be prepared to receive feedback. It won't be a session where I tell you just how lovely your painting is. I will be finding ways to, positive ways to talk about your painting. Uh, that's for sure. Um, but it, I would love it if it's a painting that I've created with you on YouTube live or from any one of my videos um, so that I could refer back to that practice and anyone who's interested could then go and create the, that painting themselves. So if you and what I intend to do with the interviews is um, give you at least a week's notice. I'll send you some questions, just some, you know, basic stuff about you and it'll kind of be like a, a few minutes of interview and then it'll be um, uh, a little bit of uh, feedback time. That's what I'm planning. Anyway, you know me, I'm vacillating. I get to do what I like. Will I do this? Will I? Not? I don't know. I just like that um, I'm thinking of ideas and I feel like I'm firing at the moment. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you so much to everyone who joined in today. Thank you for all the likes. That's really awesome. Um, tuning in tells YouTube that this is worth watching, which means that um, I get more encouraged because YouTube then tells people that this is <laughs> worth watching. And your thumbs up. I really appreciate that too. It really gives me um, such a lift. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, I hope to see you next week to paint some ballet shoes. Oh, for ballet shoes, it will be um, water-soluble markers. But you could easily do it in watercolour pencils as well. Maybe I'll do a bit of both. I'm not quite sure. Uh, yes, thanks, Liz. Yeah, it was a lot to do with um, glazing today, wasn't it? Amanda says, thank you, Karen says, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. See you next week. <laughs>